Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Monitor Your Health, the program where we educate the public on contemporary health uh, situations. My name is Dr. Femi Oboremi. I will be the host for today. We have with us um, a, a nurse who works in the UK and she wants to give us experience in ICU, especially during this COVID situation. Um, Rosalind, Hi, you're very morning. much welcome. Good morning, morning, everybody. Yeah, so one thing yeah. with Rosalind is, Rosalind is a very unique nurse. Uh, I met her a few years back in the UK and um, I remember in a very interesting environment. She is also an artist or actress. She actually yeah. won that year, she won the Nollywood, um, uh, the best Nollywood uh, award of the year in UK at that time, if I remember. And then uh, everybody was excited in the medical field, including the medical doctors uh, in Mansag. I think we met in Mansag, which is the organization yeah. where the doctor, you know, made. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Can you tell the audience a bit more about you? Uh, good morning, everybody. And I wish you compliments of the season. Uh, let us not forget that Jesus Christ is the reason of the season. Uh, and uh, uh, Happy New Year's in advance. My name is Rosalind Sunny. I just said, people normally call me RSA. So RSA stands for Rosalind Sunny. I just said. I'm a theater practitioner. I do anesthetic and recovery. I also work in ITU occasionally. I am not an ITU expert, but one, once it's needed to go to work in ITU, you go there and work because our work is related to anesthetic and recovery. And then I also work as an actress and a movie producer in, in United Thank Kingdom. Thank you so much for that, yeah. So it's really a pleasure to, to, to see you on this program. And um, we know we're going to talk about the roles of uh, nurses in ITU, obviously. Yeah. Uh, you also tell us about what happens in the theater. I know that you've been heavily involved in, in uh, managing patients in ICU, especially during this COVID period, the last, yeah. the first wave. Yeah. Uh, um, so we want to tap you know, to your experience to see what we can learn, what people can know about you know, uh, what happens there in, in ICU. So um, can you, can we just start by you just telling us about what, when we say ICU, what do we actually mean? Uh, you know, maybe we'll start from there and then we can ease into it in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> wow. Um, first of all, I would like to have, I wouldn't say research, I've sort of um, map out a little bit of, um, uh, key points. Yeah. What to show the the audience is <laughs> quite a lot, but I won't go too much into details uh, because it can be quite um, quite boring. So the role of ITU nurse basically is to we work together with the doctors, the ITU doctors. In fact, we work closely together to assess to give patient ongoing assessments diagnosis. Number one, we all know the reason why they're there. During We're talking during COVID, isn't it? Not in general. Are we? Yeah, we can, we can, yeah, we can, we can talk in general, but we, we sort of focus on, uh, on COVID. COVID situations. Okay. Yeah. So in, in, in generally, patients are brought into ITU, patients that are critically ill. There are two different, a lot of people always mix the word ITU, ICU or HDU. As soon as people hear of HDU, ITU, they just think it's ITU. It's divided into two different categories. And um, in our own expertise, we also divide them into levels, level one, level two, and level three. So for um, ITU, it's called intensive care unit. HDU is high dependency unit. So basically HDU are people that are, um, that they're not intubated. That means we're not artificially ventilating them. They can still do things for themselves. 
i.e. maybe they've undergo just a minor surgery that have resulted into um, something a bit unexpected. Uh, maybe the elective patient or patient that just coming from emergency that I rushed in to do emergency laparotomy or emergency surgery that have resulted in something happening during the surgery and then they needed monitoring overnight. So we take them to high dependency unit. Intensive care unit are people that we're talking about now, which is the COVID patient. These are the patients that we have to physically um, intubate them, put a tube down their throat to help their lungs to expand so they can breathe and continue to be alive. So people often get that two words mixed up. HDU and ITU, they are two different, two different places. So what we do basically, we work together closely with the, the, the ITU doctors or anesthetic doctor, closely assess ongoing assessment of the patient, ongoing care, because once patient has been brought to ITU, everything you have to independently do for them. Fair enough, some patients are brought to the ward, they can still do their independent, they can do things for themselves. But once your level, your case has gone to the level two or level one, that means you cannot physically do things for yourself. So we take over a total package. We call it holistic aspect of care. So we take total care of the patient from the, the list I've put here. So we do management of the patient with an endotracheal tube. Endotracheal tube is the tube that we put in their throat to help them breathe, to ventilate their lungs. Because once your lungs is not being ventilated, every organs in your body will be starved of oxygen. And once your body is being starved of oxygen, one thing that first happens, you get brain hypoxia. And once your brain is gone, nothing can function in your body. And that means the patient is going to die. So your lungs, we won't, we won't say is the, is the biggest or the most important organs in the body. All of them are all important. But without your lungs, the patient is gone. So we have to make sure patients that are cannot um, depend on themselves, on their lungs to physically expand and deflate, expand and deflate to give your body full oxygen so you can get circulation to the rest of your organs. We manually do everything for them. So one of them is called the endotracheal tube. This is endotracheal tube. This is the tube. This is the tube. And this is your, the patient's um, uh, esophagus and your uh, endotracheal. Uh, so this is your tracheal. This tube, we physically insert it in here and then we tie it in place so that your lungs can artificially ventilate for itself. So that's one aspect, one thing we do for the patient in ITU. That is a, a patient, that's a chip in there, and the patient is connected to a ventilator there. You can see it being ventilated, patient lying down, that's the patient there, it's lying down. So this one is called safe management of invasive ventilated patient. And then, then the list goes on of the bullet points, what you have to daily do for the patient. There, 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 and... So you follow, the, you follow a particular guidelines or protocol? Oh yes, we, we, we have a guideline we follow. You cannot just look after a patient that have been brought to you because everything we do in nursing has to be evidence-based. If it's not evidence-based, you do any mistake, you know, as a doctor, we work together. Everything we do, it is evidence-based. And then when it's evidence-based, you start from your A, B, C, D. So in ITU, in a nursing, we start from the A. Your A is your airway. 
even though if you have the most um, the most beautiful face in the world, the most healthiest heart in the world, the most healthier liver in the world, the most healthier kidney in the world, the most healthier pancreas in the world, if your lungs is not being ventilated, those organs cannot function well because it is your lung that will give you oxy oxygen to circulate. The oxygen goes in, that's why we have the oxygenated and deoxygenated. Your oxygen goes into your lung through, your, through the mouth, goes it into your trachea, into your bronchioles, then into your alveolus. So it's your alveolar that when we're manually vent uh, ventilating the patient, the, when we breathe normally, the mechanism of what we breathe along our breath and the oxygen goes into the alveolar, especially when you take a deep breath. That means you're probably been holding your lungs, your breathing for a while. A lot of people say, why do you do that big sigh? You are manually, you're recruiting your alveolar to, to dilate, to, to give you more, give your oxygen more boost. So your, um, your lungs continue to inflate and deflate. So when we're manually ventilating the patient, your, your lungs is continue to inflate and deflate, continue to re recruit the alveolus. And then during the COVID, we have, or even not COVID generally, we have something called CPAP. There are some patients on, 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 on oxygen at home. They cannot breathe, they can't maintain their own oxygen normally. So we give them call something called CPAP. That might be a bit too, uh, too much. It's just um, continuous, continuously, positively delivering high flow of oxygen into the lungs of the patient. So the patient continue to, to um, perfuse all our organs. So there's guidelines we have to follow all the time. Right. Uh, that's the patient. This is um, when you're, this, uh, this one is a safe management of non-invasive ventilating patient. So these are patients that are, if they bring them with COVID positive or COVID negative, because during the COVID, these are machines that high, deliver oxygen to the patient's lung at a very high volume, under high pressure. So patient, is it that you've been, you've undergone a minor surgery that something gone wrong, they brought you to ITU, uh, to intensive care unit, which is the step down HDU, a step down from ITU. So we give them this one just to continue to help their lungs inflate and deflate. Right. These are not patients that are intubated. These are just normal, normal mass, but it's still delivering high flow of oxygen to the patient. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Right. So these are the stuff you really have to manually do all the time. Okay. So when patients are non, we call it non-invasive um, ventilation. That means there's no tube inside, but we're still delivering high flow of oxygen to the patient. So you make sure you fit the mask properly. There is no point of giving a, a patient oxygen that the mask, it, it, it's because you want it to fit the mask, their, their nose from all here, all around. If for somebody that their face is, is a bit chubby or they, they have a, a lot of beard, we shave the beard off because beard can be another injury that the, the patient won't get the 100% oxygen we're delivering to them. So you make sure you shave off the beard, the face is, is bare, uh, fit the mask, you, say, you measure the mask, women and female, female will tend to go a, um, a higher um, number, female will tend to go a lower, kids are lower, lower, lower. So you make sure you fit the right mask to the nose, which is there. Uh, you position the mask properly so it's not you don't experience any leak. Uh, and you make sure patient is responding to that oxygen you're giving. Right. That's why we, we, we sorry. Hello. How do you do that? How do we position? How do we measure the leak? Yeah, the oxygen, the oxygen level. Oh. Oh, you, you mentioned oxygen level. In everything we do, do you have to attach the patient to a machine? Let me see if I can find a machine here. This is the machine. 
Okay. So. So that's the one that that's, makes noise when people enter the ICU. Just make that. Yeah, so exactly. Okay. As everything we do in ICU is all, um, we set them at a certain rate. For example, if a normal breathing rate for an adult, it's between 14, 15 to 20. So we set the limit that, okay, this also patient is a way maybe 80 kg. On a normal, a healthy adult, you breathe 16, 17, if you're, you're normal and healthy. If you weigh 90 or 80 something kg, and we set your alarm limit of your breathing rate to 16, and it goes down to, to 10 or to 12. That is not healthy for that patient at that particular time. So you hear the alarm go ping, 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 ping to alert you to say something has gone wrong with that patient. Right. So it's say ping, ping, and then it to show you a red color, a, a yellow, um, yellow color to say it is the breathing rate that is not working. Mm -hmm. Or if you set the breathing rate to be to be 16 or 17 or 18, and there's a lot of leak, because minimum leak we, we accept is maybe 10, 20. Once the leak is getting to 400 or 500, you know definitely that patient is having a deficit system where the, the, the lungs is not being ventilated properly. Mm. So the alarm will go off, ping, 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 continuously ping, ping to alert you to say something is not right. right. You check that, oh, okay, there's a leak somewhere. That's why we do a lot of mask fitting properly. Mm. With tube, you don't have to worry so much because is that there's a long something that goes direct to your lungs and uh, through your mouth, into your tracheal, then into your bronchial, then into your alveoli. It's directly in there. Okay. With mass fitting, with the CPAP or non-invasive ventilation, there can be leak. One of the example I sell is if you have a lot of big, big massive beard, or yeah. you've repositioned the patient. If patient is meant to be lying face down and patient said, oh, I'm not feeling comfortable. You want to make them comfortable. You lie them to their side. The right. mask could be tilted to one side and one side is open. That means that patient's lung is not being ventilated properly. So right. there are a lot of things that, 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 could, um, that we do in ITU, not just the lungs alone. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier on, we, we, we monitor them. So this is one of the pumps we use to, to deliver, the is it a, yeah, to, to monitor, to, to give them medications. Because on a normal day, you, you and I, we can, our brain can tell us to wake up when it's eight o'clock or when it's six o'clock to go to bed, sorry, to go to work. But for people that are, we've intubated them, they're not doing anything for themselves. Basically, if you didn't intubate that patient, the patient is dead. We don't like using that word, but it's, it's, it's real. You know, being, being alive, being dead is real. So we are, we are real to patients. We don't lie to them because it, it is a punishable offense to lie to your patient. You know, you guys have the GMC, we have the NMC. Everything you do, you have to be transparent. Everything you do has to be according to what the NMC say you should do it, according to how GMC say we should do it. It's a body we report to. So even though the, we're, we're, we're ventilating the, the lungs of this patient, patient is alive, we're keeping them kicking. Okay, so what about your daily bath? Do you, keep your, do you leave your patient lying there for four or five hours? The old day, don't forget this patient, they, are, they cannot do anything for themselves. They are just lying there in, 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 in your hands. Somebody's father, somebody's mom, somebody's auntie, somebody's husband, somebody's wife is lying there in your hands. Mm. So the decision is up to you. What do I, do I give my best to this patient? Okay, I'm ventilating the lungs of, the, of this patient. I'm keeping the patient alive. What about some other key aspects that forget about 
ventilation now, pressure areas. In bed, when you lie, do you lie there for four hours, for six hours without moving? No. You move, you turn around, you lift your hand, you lift your head, you turn to the side, you turn to that side, you lift your leg, you get up, you walk to the toilet in the middle of the night, you come back. Those are all the things that we do normally as a human being that we don't think of it. It's, it's natural to us. Our brain tells us, so Rosalind, yes, in a yeah, in a, yeah that, that leads me to the question I was going to ask that what happens in a situation where the relatives, you know, they want to know how can we help, you know, with all these things because you want, you know, they, you need them to move, you need to that. And then some, some relatives are really not comfortable. So what do you expect as a nurse from your own perspective? What do you expect from the, from the relatives so, when, when, when they're in this position? Okay, that's what I say. Everything we do, go we go according to policy. We don't just do things because we think we want to do it. Mm. So in that aspect, that patient has been lying there for four hours. That is not allowed. Patient is lying there for six hours. You're having two sets of break, three sets of break on a shift. That is not allowed. So we have something we call the pressure areas. Every one, one hours or every two, two hours. That's why we have this. If you go to ITU, you, you, you notice that this is what they use in ITU. Yeah. This is in two pages. This is every at everything you give, at every medication you're giving, don't forget that patient is not moving. So for example, if you, if you have a patient that have undergo a kidney surgery, and then you have to keep monitoring the urine output to make sure they're pee enough, you don't overload them with fluid. Then we think of the pressure areas, your key pressure area when you sleep and your, your shoulder, the sacral area, which is down uh, the bottom area when we lie down, the back of your neck, your, your heels. Mm. So we make sure we, we have a protocol that we, we physically turn the patient every two, two hours. And you, you have a column, you record it here to say you turn that patient <clears throat> from maybe eight to 10. Patient have lied on the right side. Yeah. So you turn that patient from 10 to 12, you turn the patient to the left. Nice. From 12 to four, you turn the patient maybe facing down. From facing down, not as in down, down, because there is a tube there. Face mm -hmm. down, but their, their head is sideways. In uh, two to two, two, um, four, you turn the patient back on their side, to their head to the left. So those are the things we have to continue continuously monitor every two to two hours, pressure areas. Right. Then you come to their medication bit. That's why people think nurses that work in IT, they just go there and, and, and play. Because in IT, they give you one patient, one nurse per patient. You're not allowed two patients or three patients. It has to be one nurse, one-to-one -one nursing. Mm -hmm. You are continually monitoring the medication you're giving them. Don't forget this patient is either they undergo some surgery, they will be in pain. It, this is pain that we, as a healthcare uh, practitioner, we've inflicted onto this patient. They didn't ask for pain. They didn't want to be in pain. We gave them the pain. So whatever pain you give them, you have to make sure the pain is subdued. Is it that the pain is totally gone or the pain is subdued? When patients are in pain, a lot of people probably think, but these patients are asleep. How do they know they're in pain? Trust me, as soon as you hit that knife, you cut somebody that is unconscious, you see the, the, the heart rate will shoot up. Mm -hmm. So that is telling you that, eh, eh, nurse, doctor, <laughs> I'm in pain, you're cutting me. Mm -hmm. So we give them something we call opiates, which are the morphine, fentanyl, remifentanyl, to kill that pain. Right. Or sometimes you, 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 you see patients that, um, You've, you've ventilated them, 
but they're not breathing properly. The, the, the airway pressure is, is like he's been, I don't know how to explain it to the audience because everything is done on a, um, on a machine. The machine is like our baby. We call our anesthetic machine the ventilated machine in ITU our baby because they constantly speak to us. Mm. Anything that is going wrong, they, they alert you. Like a baby will say, mommy, when they, they, they can talk, they say, mommy, I want to eat. Mommy, I want to go to the toilet. But these machines, they can't talk. The only thing they can talk is alarms. That is why you hear a lot of alarm goes on in ITU because the patient is wired up to, is it a proper for, um, for, for the COVID patient, a lot of or patients that have undergone major surgery that we don't want them to wake up, especially cardiac surgery. When you go to um, have a big cardiac surgery, you want to keep the patient alive, um, asleep and alive. <laughs> asleep and alive for, for maybe, sorry? The heart surgery, it's a cardiac yeah, surgery. This, uh, yeah, ca ca sorry, cardiac is, um, they call them cardiothoracic. Cardiac is the heart surgery. Thoracic is um, your lungs kind of surgery. So when you have a big cardiac surgery, they don't wake those patients up immediately because they want to, we want to monitor them for continuous four to two to three days to make sure everything is stable and you right. gradually wake them up. So for those patients, number one, they will be on pain relief, continuous pain relief, which is called remifentinil. They will be on continuous sleeping medication, which is the proper four, the white one. They'll be on continuous uh, muscle relaxants, which are the, don't let me go into too, too, too much, the rocuronium, vecuronium, pancuronium. They'll continually be on that. Then they'll have a catheter. Then they will have um, a whole lot of stuff will be attached, attached to them. So you see the patient, the tube, one tube will be going this side, another side will be, um, they'll have NG tube, they'll have a neckline, which is the central line, central venous pressure. Anybody going to ITU undergoing major surgery, that is number one thing we give. We make sure we give the patient a central line, a neck line access. Because on a normal peripheral cannulation, you cannot give inotrope through there. The nasty, we call them nasty drugs. They're not nasty, but they keep the patient going. You cannot give inotrope through the normal peripheral line on your hands or your leg. It has to be the, um, your big jugular vein in the neck. Okay. So those are what these pumps are for. You see patient, they will be on like a four to five different pumps. So there are things, you know, continually going through there. And sometimes because patient has been lying there for too long, their kidney might start failing then Sometimes we give them kidney, we give them dialysis on the go dialysis in yeah. ITU as well. Um, okay. So now, thank you so much, uh, Rosalind. You're giving us quite a lot of details because of the time we have to also pace up and, and touch a few other aspects of things. You know, yeah. <laughs> obviously, it sounds like you literally take control of virtually everything. Uh, Sorry, that's why I so, said that uh, there's too much, too much to do. These are the set of pumps that are all together. Then. Yeah, go on. Right. Okay, so now of importance, because it, it looks like the patients, they're quite sick. You've taken yeah. control of their respiration, their feeding, yeah. their social care, which is, you know, all these things that you turn them and do all, all sort of things. And then you support them. Now, the, 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 the relative are out there, okay? And that's the bit that really works because the person that is sick, we know you are doing your great, you're making a lot of effort, making them alive. But mm -hmm. as a relative, what, or relatives of these sick people, what is your role in helping them? Or what do, what, what do you expect from them as, as, as a relative? What do they need to do to support what you're doing to complement the result that we're getting from these patients? Okay. This, yeah, um, are, are, we yeah. are we talking in general? Sorry, are we talking in general during COVID? Let's talk in general first. If we have time, we talk slightly, you know, just one minute on, on COVID as well. 
Okay. In generally, we we allow relatives to come and visit their loved ones. Um, we have visiting time that we allow them to come in and say hello. Obviously, they cannot. The patient can't converse back to them, so they come in there. They're all crying, wanted to hold the patient's hand, wanted to sit by the bedside. All those things are expected from the relative to do, but on our side, it's not acceptable. So a lot of time you, you, you see relatives say, oh, that nurse has been horrible, that doctor has been horrible. We're not being horrible. This patient, they cannot do things for themselves. Number one, you're coming in from outside. You've been walking all over the, the town. We don't know what infection you're bringing into this patient. You want to come and hold this patient's hand. You know, with due respect to relative, we know it is a difficult time for to see your loved one can't converse back to you infections cross infection we don't want it to happen mm. this patient is lying there relying on our care then mm. you come as a relative to want to kiss you want to hug you want to hold hands we don't know what you're giving this patient in in addition to what he's already going through yeah so we always advise relative to say we do empathize with you. We sympathize with you to say, sorry, your loved one is not well. They're poorly. But please, relative, when you come, that's why we provided the uh, hand gel. You wash your hands. You don't sit on our patient's bed. Sit on the chair we provide for you to sit on. Don't bring in food. A lot of people they say they want to bring in <clears throat> they want to bring in orange juice they want to bring in this in London <clears throat> sorry in London here hospital food are there for this patient and these are in portion mm. we know what to give this patient at a certain time don't mm. say because my relative has not eaten somebody that's just undergo a major major laparotomy laparotomy means they cut your tummy from the the, your sternum here, all the way down to the, the pubic area, a big cut. They've messed around with your small intestine, your big intestine, you know, not mess around. They've sort of helped you to put things yeah. in place. Mm. So then you not... want to come and bring this massive food yeah. for this patient to eat. Right. Patient is going to eat it, the constipation will start. Once yeah. constipation starts, the patient will start straining. Number one, it's where the, the patient is straining, the intestine is still healing. It's raw, it's sore. I think it's easier for you, even in, um, in, in, in places like London, if it were yeah. to be somewhere you know, here where people can even smuggle things and give you know, to people. Exactly. So, in London, we're, we're very strict with things like that. Yeah. Number two, they start straining their wound will be, we, we've come open apart. Then Very once the wound come open apart, you're introducing infection. Infection cool. we've seen, and um, hospital acquired infection is the highest, highest, highest death rate in yes. London. Just, we're not saying because of their relative, maybe someone is not washing their hands, someone is not cleaning their patient properly, or the relative coming, you know, shaking and, Mm. So reality, we do, we understand your frustration. We understand that you, you want to cry. It's good to cry because sometimes when you cry, it helps you get things out of your chest. Please mm. cry. Hold yourself instead of hugging the patient. Come in with somebody, hug that person you come in with and cry. Mm. Don't mm. hug my patient and cry, please. Mm. Mm. So this, this tells us why sometimes, because I was going to touch on that. A lot of the time, patients come or they complain that, ah, that nurse, she's horrible. She's this and that. Because they do not understand it. And that's why I want you to actually let us know why this is the situation. So it's yeah. out of concern to protect the relative, you know, who are sick, that this mm. can happen. But sometimes, I think the emotion also, from our side as healthcare professional, we need mm. to soften it a bit. And the way we communicate to, to, to relatives. So, but the relatives need to understand with us that, you know, in situations where someone is really sick, mm. everybody is doing their best to make sure the person is alive. Sure and once you get yeah. into the ICU, the meaning is just like we've been told, 
we're taking care of this person's, you know, breathing. You can't breathe yeah, on your yeah. own. And because we're taking care of this, it becomes really serious. And every hand has to be on deck to make sure this person is alive, including what you do as a relative. So when the nurse mm -hmm. comes and tell you, don't do this, and you do, there are still other people they're also talking to. So it's a bit challenging, but you need to understand the angle that this nurse is coming from. Yeah, Try yeah. and comply with things. Thank you so much, Rose, again. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry to uh, chip in there. There yeah. are some exceptional circumstances as a nurse. That's why you, as an experienced nurse, you, you judge situation for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, there are some horrible nurses. I'm not going to sit here and defend <laughs> them. Yeah, there are some nurses, they're so mean. There yeah. are some doctors, they, 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 they do things. Those nurses, it's not like they mean, they, they go according to book. We call them textbook nurses or textbook doctors. Mm. Your blood pressure has to be 120 over 70 all the time. No, <laughs> it doesn't have to be that all the time. So there are some exceptional circumstances you can, at least, you know, rules are made, rules are meant to be bad, to be, you know, broken. But make sure when you break the rules for the relative, you do the due diligence so nobody get hurt at the end of the day. Thank you so much. So it's been quite an enlightening, uh, you know, uh, evening. There are a couple of things I want us to do, but we, we have to talk about, but we only have about 10 minutes or five minutes left actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, firstly, you know, I know uh, COVID is here again. Mm -hmm. and they're not having different strains. Yeah. What's, what are your, what's, what's your experience? Maybe in, in, in a minute or two, just let's share a bit from your experience in, in London and then see how Possibly, we don't know which nurse here is watching you or is listening to this program. What can they learn from what you do? So in one minute. Uh, what to do in ITU or in general? In, let's just do a general, let's give a general, uh, you know, knowledge out there now. Overview. Oh, right. Okay, at the moment, they find this new variant that we don't know how it emerged. We know the COVID were there before, and then during the summer, it sort of disappeared. But now because of the cold, it's, it's back here again. We know in London, we have four seasons, and we happen to be in one of our seasons, which is the winter season. It's very cold, and it has brought this, this COVID back with a new variant. We don't know what that is, but there is a vaccine out there that is killing the old COVID and the new form of COVID that have come. So please, as a nurse, as a healthcare provider, or even though if you're not in our field, please, let's keep to all the government advice. Let's keep to all the, the guide, uh, guide, guidelines they're giving us, which is wash your hands regularly, wear your mask, don't go too close to people, keep your social distance. As a family, I know we're, we're family, we want to socialize, but please see that family member that everybody you see has got COVID. Don't say <laughs> we in in, uh, in healthcare professional we have something we call universal precaution. Everybody you see had something wrong with them. So see your family member that they have something wrong with them uh, until they can prove otherwise. They've taken the mm -hmm. test or they're not showing any signs and symptoms. So please look after yourself. You are number one. Your doctor, your nurse, your sister, your mom, your dad. They are not number one you are number one so look after number one first all right thanks so much uh rosaline so the other bit i was going to you know in one minute i know you know we've had this personal discussion before about you being a nurse and also an artist or mm -hmm. actress and you have your own movie you have movies that you produce you have movies you have directed you are so busy in that in that sphere i noticed there was one that came out maybe early this year or so I'm and it, yeah. I need yeah. to work that one now. So uh, <laughs> can you tell us how do you manage? What is your experience? You only have one minute. Tell us about yeah. your experience as, a, as an act, actress and how do you manage to cope with you know that world and the medical world as well? Okay, number one, I work as an independent, uh, I won't say consultant. I, you know the word as a locum. I work as an agency staff locum in healthcare, that's keep me going. And number two, my I'm able to manage my time because in nursing, everything we do is prioritizing time management. 
So I'm able to manage my time and prioritize what I need to do throughout the day with the help of my family, my husband, my kids, my dad, all my friends around me. Can you do this for me? Can you go and do, take care of that one? Can you go and do that while I do this? It's called prioritization and it's called time management and delegation. So in a nutshell, I would say is my family, is myself, is people around me that have kept me going in the medical world and in the, in, in the movie world. Trust me, in the movie world, it can be quite challenging. In the medical world, it is extremely challenging. In the medical world, you have a profession you report to. In the uh, artist world, you have nobody you report to. You report to your fans. So the two worlds is who comes first. Obviously, my professional comes first, which is as a nurse. So my patient's life, keeping their sanity, keeping them alive comes first to me before my, my other job, which is my uh, movie producing. So I've been able to keep myself going, to keep myself happy with family, with friends, and with myself managing my time well. Well done, so well done, well done, well done. So what's next in your movie world? I know uh, you, you just released one. COVID is there. You better do something around COVID. We all, we all... No, we were actually meant to be shooting a movie around um, autistic children uh, oh. in, in May. All oh, right. We're just about, yeah, we're just about to kick off shooting. And when, no, yeah, in May, then the COVID lockdown started in February, February, March, April, mm -hmm. until now. So we're able to, we're unable to do anything. So which I, as I, I, saw, I saw that you picked an award in Nigeria recently. Is that about right or wrong? Yes, I yes. Your okay. Yes, yeah, right. so that, that one is called Nollywood uh, Lonelywood Legendary Award. So wow. I won the best best UK actress producer. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much for giving us the time today. Always uh, appreciate what you do, and then uh, you you're one of those people in in the in the health world that uh, we see as a flagship, especially when you talk about entrepreneur and you talk about you know combining what you do with um, with medicine. So well done, well done, well done, well done, and thank you for today for the viewers. Thank you so much for joining us again for today's uh, edition. Uh, we hope that you pick one or two things from this uh, ch chats. Um, obviously, if you have questions, you can always leave them be, uh, down here. Um, Rosalind will be picking them and be answering them every now and then. I will also go in there every now and then and pick and answer. And um, please take care of yourself. Just like you've been told, COVID is, I mean, COVID is here again, is ravaging. There are a lot of people who have died, even in Nigeria. I can yeah. tell you, doctors who have died recently because of this don't think it's a joke. It is very serious and we need to take it that way. Nigerians, I know that we, we break rules a lot. We don't like things that tie us down. We like to be free. But at the same time, consider your relative, consider yourself. You might think that you're strong. You do not have this condition. But if you pick it, you give it to your parents who are in the range where they're at risk. And then will you forgive yourself by doing that to, to, to your family? So thank you so much. Face masking, social distancing, and washing, and all these things, they are really crucial at this stage. The new variant, there's another one in Nigeria now that's just coming up. We don't know what it is. The only thing you can do, is not even the vaccine, is what you know that will help. And those are the yeah. things. Face masking, social distancing, hand washing, and all the like. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward Thank to meeting you in next week. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you. And bye-bye, the audience.